going on everybody? Mike? I'm Craig. And welcome to another episode of Two, Two Wizards, Wizards, One Table. Today, we're talking about historic pieces <laughs> of historic dice history. It's historic. So let's go ahead and dive right on in. Firstly, we're going to talk about the Monopoly Millennium Edition. Mm. All right, which was, you know, the anniversary edition for Monopoly. Monopoly. Uh, you know, it was the special 2000 and included a pair of the special crystal style dice. Hmm. There's a small problem with that. <laughs> Two years previous, Crystal Cast not only released but patented this shape of D6. It's not exactly the same because the proportions are different, but the alignment is exactly the same. All they did, all they did was shrink the triangle a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, it's pipped instead of numbered. And pipped instead of numbered. This sparked a lawsuit from the owner of Crit Michael Bowling, the owner of Crystal Cast. He sued Hasbro. It went on for years and years and years. Um, ended up costing Hasbro $446,182 for patent infringement. <laughs> as soon as that lawsuit was filed, these started to get replaced. With your standard, standard D6. hip D6s mm -hmm. of the exact same color. But shortly before that... <laughs> this was the funny part. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're, they claimed there was a shortage of the special dice. This was included with the uh, rule booklet. Inside the rule book. So your pair of dice was not two of these. It was... Two of those. One of each. Which, in Monopoly terms, <laughs> do not pass go. Do not collect $200. 200 <laughs> Hey, almost half a million. Holy shit. All right, I'm sure. This is why you don't infringe on other people's patents, is sooner or later, somebody's going to catch it. Kevin Cook, the Guinness World Record holder for the largest dice collection, and uh, the guy that runs DiceCollector.com, he was actually a, a witness on, on the dice history in the, in the trial for it. But this die in and of itself is a very interesting piece mm -hmm. of dice history. You can still get them. You can find unopened sets of Monopoly Millennium Edition. The problem is you don't know if you're getting two of these, or one of these and one of these, or two of these. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's a gamble. <laughs> yeah. And one of the very few lawsuits about dice themselves that I'm actually aware of. Mm. Um, you can find articles, you can find coverage about it all over the internet. I, I wrote a small article on it myself. We'll have the link below. And that's the Monop Monopoly Millennium Edition dice. Mm -hmm. The Millennium fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up in our historic pieces of historic dice history. <laughs> Try saying that five times fast. Is a Japanese Standard Association icosahedron dice. Um, it's a mouthful. These are... I've read that they could date back to the 1950s. Um, I have seen no evidence of that. I do know these exist at least as far back as 1961. Uh, there's a review of them in a mathematics journal. These were created by the Japanese Standards Association at a time when it, it was a cheaper way to generate random numbers than to uh, use a computer. Mm. Computers were rare and ridiculously expensive. But if you needed to do scientific calculations, mathematics, whatever, you needed decimal plate, random decimal places, you would roll these. There's a lot of legend behind these. All right, I've only seen four, three others besides my, my own that exist. Tim Kask, who was the original editor of Dragon Magazine, and uh, I think his name is John Peterson, 
author of uh, Playing at the World, Kevin Cook of DiceCollector.com. He has a set. What's interesting about his set, we'll pop a picture up, mm -hmm. is uh, the case is different. Um, his is a full rolling case. It's a, um, it's a rolling case that you physically shake it and the dice roll. John Peterson did a video that featured these recently, and he claimed that this case was a, a rolling case. There's barely enough room for these dice yeah. to made move, and I shook it aggressively three different times, and the blue die never changed. Mm -hmm. I don't think this case was intended for that, but the one Kevin Cook has yeah. most definitely does. Yeah, because I actually cleaned this case yeah. for you, and... Like, yeah, there's really no yeah, room it's for not. I don't. I don't think this case was intended for rolling. No. Tim Cask had a set of these, and he and other people have claimed that these were the original D20s that they used to play with. They were very durable plastic, um, mm -hmm. much more durable than what was done at the time. I almost think that these are made of urea, which is what the speckled dice from mm. Chessex are made from, which mm. is little small plastic pellets that are heated and compressed, and uh, Chessex speckled and their opaque dice are made that way. Mm. And it makes them very, very durable. If you look at a speckled dice you just bought today, and the identical dice from 20 years ago, the mm -hmm. speckles don't wear. They could date to as old as, as 1961. Um, but they're in beautiful condition, and they feel they are. They, they feel like they're very durable. Yeah, no, the they don't feel much different than um, the dice you would normally roll today. Yeah, they're 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 a little smaller. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're very small. They're they're bigger than the uh, the I think they're the fifteen millimeter mini D twenties that Kraken does. Mm -hmm. They're bigger than that, but not by much. Yeah. But uh, they, yeah, they were definitely used in war games in the middle in the mid '60s because I, I it, if you go to the article I wrote on these linked below, you'll see I, I include um, articles and excerpts from contemporary magazines and and books um, where there's reviews of these and uh, they're mentioned in a uh, a war gaming book. I believe it was issued by the Navy in 1966. Hmm. <laughs> Um, it mentioned the long time by right. name. <laughs> yeah. The oldest reference I have is 1961. The the lid that claims there's a trademark on it, or I'm sorry, a patent on it. I could not find a U.S. patent on these. Um, I know nothing about Japanese patents and tried to search anyway mm -hmm. um, to no avail. If you all know anything about searching for patents and would like to look this up, I. I would love it. We appreciate the help because we've dug deep and have only pulled up nothing. <laughs> yeah, it says uh, Japanese Standards Association Icosahedron Dice. Next up today in our historic dice of historic history <laughs> are Zaz Polyspheres. This was a uh, game that was released by Advertising Attractions in 1963. As far as, well, pretty much anybody's been able to tell, this is the first example of all of the platonic solids being used in a game. You know, and this is 10 years before Dungeons and Dragons was released. 11 years before it was officially released. Um, these are very, very soft plastic dice. Um, but you see, you have your standard, you have your D4, which, this yeah, is pretty damn funny. Lopsided. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, not only is it lopsided, but, let's see, no, here we go, how well you can see. Each side has a single number, that's the one, there's the three, there's the two, and the four, and they, they actually look handwritten. Mm -hmm. They don't on the D4. Um, the instructions for this game tell you to roll the die, pick it up, and look at the bottom to know which number you rolled. Um, the D20 also looks like it's just handwritten. There's no engraving or anything with the uh, numbers. 
The D6 is the only one that actually has molded numbers um, that are clearly molded. Mm -hmm. There is even a, uh, what does that say on there? I believe it says um, Hong Kong molded right in there underneath the number six. <laughs> <laughs> HK. Um, to my knowledge, it's the first D20 that's numbered one through 20. It does say Hong Kong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the instructions. Oof. Oh, God, this paper is so fragile. Yeah. <laughs> That's how old it is. Here's an instruction sheet. The The intent of the game, if you read through them, they're online on my uh, on the website. We'll link below. Um, it's basically a, uh, a Yahtzee-like game. Mm. You just you roll the dice, you get... Um, Let's see, each player throws all five at once. You look at all three dice and you add, oh, you add pairs of matching numbers together. Mm. Um, it's, I've tried playing it not with these dice, <laughs> um, but with a standard set of poly. Oh, come on. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's not a fun game, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I've only seen one other set. Um, it's identical to mine. The case is in a little better shape. Um... Uh, that's in Kevin Cook's collection. I know this is for serious collectors. This is, you know, a must-have. It's a white but whale. But it's impossible to find. It's mm -hmm. definitely a white whale. The interesting thing about this is um, there were stories circulating in the gaming communities. It started in the uh, war game communities in the late 60s through to RPGers in the 70s. In the 80s, I even heard the story of a guy who tried to patent polyhedral dice. Turns out that patent actually exists, but it was not for the dice. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll flash that on the screen for mm -hmm. you too. That was for Zaz Polyspheres. It was at a time when you could still patent a, a game rule set. You can't patent rules anymore. Yeah, no you can't. Um, so what was patented was the rule set that comes with these. The confusion comes because the patent included a detailed diagram of the five dice. But the patent was not for the dice. The patent was for the game rule set. Oh. Yeah. Which um, makes sense, but... As far as anybody's been able to tell, I believe I already said it, but this is the oldest... Um, example of a polyhedral set being used in a game. So but somewhere in a school hidden in a facilities room somewhere you sure. might find these. Oh Shane and the Goblin Dice Ward? Mm -hmm. He has a set of Holmes dice that he got from his mother who was a school teacher in the 70s. <laughs> which means it's probably not, which <laughs> means it's probably not an actual set of Dungeons and Dragons dice. It mm -hmm. was probably the set from Creative Publications which sold educational supply. Right. That's Zaz, Zaz Polyspheres, one of my prizes in my collection, as all of these in this video were. That was our a handful of historic pieces of historic dice history. With history <laughs> and touches of history with historic history that is historically historic. Sure. So, <laughs> and, and I hope you like this. Um, this was not a direct request, but somebody pointed out to me that they would like to see um, the exceptional pieces in my collection, and these mm -hmm. are some of them. We'll be showing off more in, in upcoming episodes. Sure to like, share, subscribe. Mm -hmm. What is it? Ring, ring the bell so you can get notifications when we have new videos. Right now we're trying to do them mm -hmm. every Friday. Every Friday. We're scheduling these for every Friday. Of course, at the same time, too, is like we'll probably have some bonus videos here and there. But of course, at the same time, too, is if you have preferences on what you would like us to review or anything like that, or if you have something you would like us to review, feel free to contact us, uh, strangeangongames.com comments down below. Personally, don't put your personal information in the comments down below. Please contact us for that. Yeah, don't, 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 yeah, don't, don't throw it out there. there. <laughs> People are shady. Worst case scenario, keep the madness rolling on. on the tabletop. <laughs> Take it easy.
If you would like to check out more from Strange Aeon Games, you can go to our website at strangeaeongames.com. Sign up and receive notices on new posts and new projects, as well as information about tabletop knowledge. You can also browse our store for accessories and apparel, which some are exclusive only to our store.